Welcome back to the Minds of Mountain Film. I'm Beth Gage and I'm a documentary filmmaker. And I'm here today with Dr. Terry Root. So Terry, this weekend at Mountain Film, uh, our symposium, as you know, was on extinction. Mm -hmm. I would love it if you would explain for us some of the parameters of what is a mass extinction. A mass extinction? Yeah. yeah. So what a mass extinction is, is when there's a very large proportion of the species on the planet go extinct. And we've had five of them thus far. There's, they've been caused by things like asteroids hitting the Earth and so much dust going up into the stratosphere that it blocks out the sun and it's, it, it, it causes a lot of changes and a lot of extinctions. And that's basically what's going on right now is the beginning of that. And um, how we can tell it's beginning is the background um, extinction rate is about, well, it's less than one species per thousand species in a millennium. Right now, the extinction rate is up to 100 species per thousand species. And that is a lot. So that's one out of 10 species. And that's a bunch of species that are going extinct. We're on the same trajectory of getting to a very large proportion of the species going extinct. And when you say, a hundred out of a thousand. Yeah. Over what period of time? Over a millennium. Over over a thousand years. Wow. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So. Um, when in your research did you realize that there was a problem with species going extinct or species habitat changing? Uh, would you talk to us a little bit about that? Yeah. I I actually did it kind of surreptitiously. Back when I did my PhD, I was supposed to be doing very, very basic biology. So I went in and I said, this is what I want to do. I want to look at species on a continent-wide scale. Usually people are working on a study area that's about the size of a tennis court. But I was looking at a whole continent, and I realized how important temperature was. I knew global warming was there. I knew that we have habitat destruction, and if species are going to try to move to, and stay with the same temperature, as the temperature gets warmer, it's going to get the species are going to want to move north or poleward or up in elevation. And if there's habitat destruction in that area, they're not going to be able to do that. So that was when I really got, got concerned about it. So I guess you, did you already know that there was global warming or climate change? Or did your research tell you that there was global warming? Well, that's an interesting story in the sense that I knew that temperature was important to species and I knew that there was something like global warming but I didn't really know what it was until I went to a seminar that was held by the Fish and Wildlife Department and they were talking all about how climate change was affecting species and they were using the work that I was doing to show how important temperature was for species so that was when it all fit together and that was about 91, 1991. So would you talk a little bit about how plants and animals are changing, what they, whether they adapt to their habitat, whether they change their habitat, um, and whether they're actually maybe physically even changing? Yeah, yeah. Um, species have, have been, have had to adapt to climate change in the past. And what they do is they actually will go towards the poles as it gets warmer. It's, they need to be going towards the poles where it stays cooler. They go up in elevation where it's staying cooler. The other thing they do is they come back earlier in the spring. Birds come back from migration earlier in the spring because the flowers are out earlier, They're, the bugs are out earlier, they can come back earlier. They also change behavior. Um, a lot of species will become a, um, they'll, they'll burrow under the ground when they hadn't before. If it gets too hot, they have to get into some area. So that's what they do, is they really change their behavior a lot um, in that manner. Um, we met um, because of a young man, Tim De Christopher, mm -hmm. uh, on whom we're doing a film, who monkey wrenched a BLM auction. And he, right off the bat, told us that one of the most influential uh, pieces of evidence that upset him and uh, coaxed him into doing what he did was the talk that you gave at the University of Utah a couple of years ago. Mm -hmm. I was wondering, you know how, how powerful the information that you have is, and I wonder if you'd talk a little bit about your concerns about imparting that information to people and how you deal with those concerns. It's, it's actually a very, very difficult thing to, to titrate because on the one hand, I know that we're having a mass extinction. I know that a lot of our species are going extinct. 
But then on the other hand, I don't want to stand up and tell everybody that we're going to hell in a handbasket because then everybody will sit, throw their hands up and not do anything. So it's a very fine line that I find myself walking. And what I do is I will, I will have it be fairly broad when I'm giving a, a public presentation. But then if people come up to me afterwards, which is what Tim did, and they start asking me about it, then I, I will tell them what it, it real, how bad I really do think it is. But I feel as though I can't do that to a general public because it, it, it's pretty dire. Mm -hmm. 50 years from now, it's going to be a completely different looking world, completely different. Yeah. Are, are you changing at all the information that you're giving? I am. I had a long talk with Tim and he was saying, Terry, you're, you, you need to start telling the truth a little bit more. And it's not that I'm, I'm not telling the truth. I always tell the truth. I'm just withholding some of it. But now I'm trying to impart a bit more. And I just talked to Tim about the, the speech that I gave here. And he said, well, you, you were a little bit better, but you still have a long way to go. <laughs> so well, I tried. It, it, it motivated him, that's yeah. for sure. Yeah. yeah. Um, I, I wonder if you would talk a little bit about what you think our priorities are as far as addressing this um, mass extinction. What can we do and how can we um, try and slow things down? Or can we? Can we slow things down? Right. Well, in order to to do something about what's going on with climate change is we have got to start weaning ourselves off of carbon. Um, the CO2, that's, the emissions that are going into the atmosphere are just too much. Um, it's, gonna, it's causing the ocean to become acidic, which means then that anything, anything that uses calcium in their body is going to have a very, very difficult time um, forming whatever they need, whether it be a skeleton or a, or a shell or, or, or whatever. So the more we put into the atmosphere, the, the worse the ocean is going to become. The more we put in the atmosphere, the warmer the planet is getting, and species really can't withstand a lot of heat. There's, some species can, can withstand a lot, but not extreme. So all of us have a different kind of, of, of way that we can, we can handle heat. Um, so some species already are shif shifting, some are not. Um, but what we could do is we could have a corridor, set up corridors for species to, to meander up and, and get up to the poles where it's cooler. Um, it's, it's that type of thing. We have to start thinking outside of the box because if we don't, we're gonna lose even more species. What, what does a corridor look like? I mean, how do we do something well, like that? And where would they, that's where, right. would, where are the important corridors? Yeah, that's, that's the tough part because I'm sure, well, I'm sure that I don't want a corridor going right through my house, right? <laughs> so what, how can you ask people to, to give away their property for corridors? Mm -hmm. So it's a very, very difficult thing to, to do it in, in retrospective um, manner. But what we do is we just try to have enough of habitat close enough by to each other, to each other like islands. They can island hop, mm -hmm. that type of thing. Mm -hmm. That would be a corridor. And is that something that people are actually working on now? Very strongly. Yeah. There's a, a uh, very strong, um, let's see, there's a very strong push right now to have a very wide corridor going from um, the Yellowstone up to the Yukon, uh -huh. so that that's, that will be a, a strong one. There's, there's also going to be various other corridors. It depends upon the species. They really are looking at species and seeing which ones need corridors. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I'm not answering that very well. But no, anyway. I, I, I got, got that. It. I, okay. Understand. Okay. I understand. I um, understand. Um, another thing that I was thinking about, that here at, at Telluride and Mountain Film, we're up at just about 9,000 feet, and the mountains around us are up to 14,000 feet. Mm -hmm. I'm just wondering what particular, if you've thought at all, about what are concerns, which animals, birds, and, and what kind of uh, problems we have at this, at this altitude. Well, the, the, mountains are, the mountain species are having more trouble, I believe, than other species, because what happens is, is that as it gets warmer, the species are having to move up in elevation. Woo, it's windy. Yeah. <laughs> so they're moving up in elevation. The trouble is, is that as you get higher and higher, the, the ground, the area of, the, of where they can be is smaller. So that makes sense when you're, when you're talking about something like, that mm -hmm. looks like this. But the other problem is, is, is that they're going up. The ones that are up at the top have no place to go, except extinct. 
Or what we can do is we could go with our U-Haul trailers and go and pick them up and move them someplace else and try and help them survive. But there's not enough U-Haul trailers around to pick up as many species as we need to. Right, and it's, yeah. it, there's not too many places above 13,000 feet that that's right. we can even take them to. That's right, yeah. that's, that's the problem. Yeah. It really yeah. is a, t a difficult problem. Yeah, and I guess, um, are, there, are there certain species that we know will survive and certain species that we know won't survive? And, yeah. and I know you've talked about the mm -hmm. term of, of saving certain species because we know they need help and we can help we them. Can do, that. do you want to talk yeah. a little bit about yeah. that? Well, the species that I am the most concerned about as far as going extinct are those that have very small ranges. So they, they occur in very, very limited area. They need to have, um, they need to have very special food or they need to have very special place to live, like a special tree or something like that. Is, are there um, examples? Um, the Kirtland's Warbler in Michigan is a good example. They have to have trees that are not older than 15 years, um, but they have to be at least 10 years. So they have a five-year window there. It has to be in a place where there's a lot of sandy soil and you, know, you, you can just build on and build on and build on. And so, but the Kirtland's Warbler is being is is being protected fairly well because they've they've been working on it for so long uh -huh. so that that works but having a small area having a low population to begin with having very very specialized um, habitats that they need are the ones that I'm I'm the most concerned about um, now there are species that will do just fine and I think the, the primary species that will end up doing fine are those that that can co-occur with us. So we have the English sparrow in, in America now that is very, very, very common in our cities. We have raccoons, we have cockroaches, we have skunks, you know, that, <laughs> that type of stuff. <laughs> Those will do really well. The corvids also, the, the crows and the ravens and things like that will, will do well because they're generalists. They're not specifically having to have one particular type, type of, of food. Mm. But the ones like the polar bear, that's where we have problems. Huh? The polar bear we're having problems with because its habitat is being destroyed. Mm -hmm. it, has to, in, in the, um, it has to feed by going out on the sea ice and having a, a, a seal will come up and they'll grab the seal as it comes up to breathe um, and in a hole in the ice and the, the bear is right there. Well, when there's no ice, they can't go out and, and catch the seals that way. Now, so the, the the population of polar bears is going down. I don't think it'll ever go extinct, but the species that rely on the polar bear are indeed in, in dire straits right now. Um, there's two gulls, the ivory gull and the Ross gull, that when the polar bear will grab the seal and, and kill it, it, it flings blood and guts <laughs> literally <laughs> all over the place. Well, that blood and guts is what the Ross gull and the ivory gull live on. Uh -huh. And if that's not around, their populations are going down. Again, here it is a very specialized mm -hmm. uh, type of, mm -hmm. of food that they're, mm -hmm. that they're using, mm -hmm. so. Yeah, well, one um, other thing, I'm wondering what you think. We all, we all know this problem at this point. I mean, we know the problem of global warming exists. Mm -hmm. What, in your opinion, is what we need to get us up off our chairs and out of our couches and houses and really start oh. to, do we need a a person, yeah. uh, a plan, what do yeah. we need to, to make a difference? Well, I'm not sure there's just one thing. Um, if I had to say that there was, if I could have anything in the world right now, what would I have? I would have all of the disinformation people shut up. <laughs> <laughs> it drives me nuts because they provide disinformation. It keeps the public completely confused and it keeps the public on their couches not doing anything. Yes. They're just sitting saying, oh, the scientists don't know, so I'm not gonna do anything. Yeah. That's the first thing I would do. This, the next thing I would do would be try and cut down how much CO2 is going in the atmosphere. That's gonna save more species than, than not. Mm -hmm. And so that is, that is, in my opinion, the second thing that, that needs to, to be happening. So if I can pick two instead of one, <laughs> Those are the two that I would pick. Good, okay. Well, thank you so much for coming to Mount oh. Film. We've, we've loved having you here and hope you've enjoyed yourself. It has been fantastic. Thank Thanks. you. Thanks. Bye.